all kind of conditions to water. To provide for the safety of those attending this meeting, please listen to the following instructions in case of an emergency. First, please take a moment to note where your exits are. If an emergency arises that prompts us to evacuate, please exit this room in a quick and orderly manner through one of the two doors to your right, and then proceed to the nearest stairwell, directions to which are indicated by the exit sign. Once you exit the building, we ask that you safely cross Bramble Street, the street that runs inside our building, to our parking lot to be safely away from the building. Our staff will provide additional direction and assistance. In the case of a tornado warning, we ask that you exit this room into the hallway, where we will remain until it is safe to exit. In the event of an active shooter in the building, we will run if there's an accessible escape path and try to evacuate the premises. If you can't evacuate, Find a place to hide where you are less likely to be found and lock any doors that you can. And as a last resort, and only for life of an imminent danger, fight. Our staff will provide additional assistance on what to do. Thank you for your attention. God, we give thanks for this day, for life, health, and strength. Bless our minds that we might think about the people that we serve and serve with an earnest spirit. Christ our Lord. Public again is called to order to receive certain comments, relatives. I don't think missed that one, <laughs> You've got the minutes of your previous meeting in your packet. Uh, you know, this is your correction. <laughs> a public hearing is called to order to receive citizen comments relative to the Downing Consortium Annual Action Plan. The public meeting is called to order. Mr. Peters, would you please read the public comment? Yes, sir. In accordance with federal regulations at 24 CFR Part 91, the City of Rice and Mount and the Downing Consortium Consortium has prepared a consolidated plan for U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, development campaign program. The consolidated plan covers a three-year period from 2021 through 2023. As part of the consolidated planning process and annual action plan for program year EY 2022 <coughs> has also been prepared, which outlines how the city intends to expand an estimated $506,949,000 in federal community development block grant funds CDBG and $407,772 in home investment partnership program funds. A draft of the proposed annual action plan will be made available for public review and comment for 30 days beginning May 10, 2022, and ending on June 13, 2022. Copies of the draft document will be available for review at the following locations during regular business hours. Planning and Development Department, H. County Administrative Building, Bill 170 Andrew Street, Harbor, North Carolina, 27886. Public hearings at the same ad address Monday, June 6 at 7 p.m. in the Commissioner's Room on the second floor. And the Department of Community Development, Frederick and Attorney's Municipal Building, 331 South Franklin Street, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, 27884, with a public hearing at that same address Monday, June 13 at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chamber on the third floor. In addition, the draft document can be reviewed online at www.rockymountnc.gov. Public hearings on the proposed act annual action plan will also be held. Information regarding the date, time, and location are above. Please be sure to check out the website for each apartment for updates. Written comments are encouraged and should be received at the following location no later than June 13, 2022, by 12 noon to be considered. This is Cornelia LDD, Interim Director of Community Development, 331 South Franklin Street, PO Box 1180, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, 278802. It is anticipated that the City Council of the City of Rocky Mountain will take up the proposed annual action plan at its regular meeting on June 13, 2022, at 7 p.m. The City will submit the 2022 annual action plan to the on before June 30, 2022. Is that 
Mr. Service Chairman, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Cornelia McGee, who's the Director of Community, uh, Community Development for the City of Rocky Mountain, to come forward to give an overview of the annual action plan update. Thank you. So 
this year, we will, uh, a little over $91,000 would be set aside uh, for this upcoming year for Edgecombe County and the participating jurisdictions that are referenced. Um, also, you have in the last uh, row uh, other participating jurisdictions, and they include Shoxburg with 4%, uh, Spring Hope 1.81%, uh, Middlesex 1.29%, and Whitaker's 1.22%. And that's uh, a little bit over $37,000. So the public comment period is actually uh, at least 30 days. So the notice, public notice went out on May 10th. It will run through June 30th, so it's a little over 30 days. Uh, we anticipate sending, submitting the plan to HUD by June 30th. There will be a, another public hearing on June 13th during the Rocky Mount City Council meeting at 7 p.m. on next Monday. Um, and then any additional comments or uh, that are done between now and then, we would anticipate um, incorporating those comments into our annual action plan. That concludes the presentation. I don't know if you may have any questions for me, but I'll be glad to answer if you did. Any questions for Ms. Virginia from the board? Yes, sir. Can you tell me how many uh, people or families you were able to help with the 2021 funds? So with the 2021 funds, we were able to assist four residents here in the county with this current fiscal year of funding with the money that's being set aside for the reconcilement for Edgecombe County, which is a little over $475,000. We are anticipating being able to assist at least 12 households. We may be able to assist a couple of more households, but that's gonna depend on the bids. Right now, we're anticipating that those bid amounts would be up to $50,000. And so that's how we're basing the allocation of roughly about 12 homes at this point. And depending upon the condition of those homes and the bid, we may be able to do a couple of additions of homes. But right now, it's definitely going to be able to assist 12 households within the county. And these are grants, not loans. Keep in mind that the home program is a deferrable, forgivable loan. It means that there is a period of affordability. The period of affordability for 10 years or less is 10% each year. It's forgiven over a 10-year period. If the loan amount is 40,000 to 50,000, then there's a 15-year period of affordability. So yes, it is a loan. It is a forgivable loan as long as they remain in the home then the home each year, 10% will be forgiven. If for some reason, if the person would pass away, then one of the things that we try to do is to make sure that that homeowner has kind of uh, had some time to think about before expiring who they would like for the home to be passed along to. That person or individual though, would have to meet the qualifications of being low to moderate income. So an immediate family member that's low to moderate income could assume that loan. And, it's, and then what would happen is, then we would collect that information, that homeowner's uh, residence information, and then there would also, we would have to include them also as part of the deed of trust. So they would have, have to have one ownership of the property. And then they would have to meet the program guidelines. If for some reason they don't meet the program guidelines and the homeowner or the homeowner's heirs or family members decide to continue to want to keep the home, then we have to determine how long they actually, uh, like say for instance, if the loan was for 10 years and maybe the homeowner lived in the home for five years and then they passed away. So then 50% of that loan would then be back doable. So what would then have to happen, because we're not in the business of wanting to, um, in the real estate business. So we want to work with that family to see what we can do to make sure that they continue to keep that home. That's the overall goal. So one of the things that we have to make sure we're doing is, because these are federal funds that we receive, so we're required to assist a family that's low to moderate income. So that's our first goal, is to make sure that that person who occupies that dwelling as their primary residence 
is low to moderate income. Uh, is this told on the front end when people first apply, not during the middle of the conversation? It should be told on the front end. And so now keep in mind, a lot of times when people are trying to get assistance, sometimes they hear the information and sometimes they don't. But one of the things that we do before they sign an agreement, we share with them the agreement in advance so that they can review it with their family. We also ask that they bring a family member with them so that the family can also understand what they're signing. And then they have a three day right to cancel. Final question, I'm sorry. Um, how, do, how are we getting this information out to citizens? So we're working with um, the director here of planning office, Ms. Katina Braswell for Edgecombe County. We have monthly consortia meetings. And so we meet with the various nine jurisdictions in a big group meeting. We're also meeting monthly with Ms. Braswell and the county manager. I believe it's the third uh, Wednesday, or Thursday of the month. We meet monthly. So we're going around visiting with the various jurisdictions individually, particularly Edgecombe County, Nash County, Town of Shawksburg, and we're in the process of also meeting with Tarver. But that doesn't tell me how my citizens are finding out about it. You're They're meeting. finding out through it's advertised in the paper. That's what I'm going to find out. Yes. It's also shared here at this office, in, in, the, in the planning office. And then one of the things that Ms. Braswell does is to make sure that it's disseminated to those various participating jurisdictions, like Princeville, Pine Tops. Kenita, to all of the jurisdictions that are here in Edgecombe County, Ms. Braswell assists us with that. We're also working right now with the town of Kenita with getting the information re-advertised so that more residents would have an opportunity to participate and apply. I have the reason I was asking because um, a lot of my district, they don't get a newspaper anymore, they can't afford it. So I was like, what other avenues are we using to make sure that this information gets into the right hands besides just the newspaper. Right, and so we're, we actually share it with the local jurisdictions, and so we're hoping that those local jurisdictions also make it available at their town hall meetings, <laughs> doing some door-to-door -door canvassing maybe, mm -hmm. but we kind of, Rocky Mount as the lead entity, provides the information to those jurisdictions and they were hoping that those jurisdictions are helping us with giving the information more disseminated because they know the residents in their community. Also during the application period, we share it, we post it on our website, on social media. Um, also, Ms. Braswell, in their office, they get calls all the time for people wanting to apply for programs like this. So when we don't have an open application period, they keep a list of names and addresses so that when we do start taking to what I see in print here, it says, you know, a, a gracious for pine tops for Camilla and uh, Francis, but uh, I'm thinking about Michael School, I'm thinking about Lee, I'm thinking about Steve. Yep. Uh, can you, Ms. McGee, can you, is there a rationale, I'm sure there is, why am I just seeing the jurisdictions of pine tops, Camilla, uh, Francis, okay. because some, nobody has applied or whatever, no. So what you see before you are the okay. jurisdictions that are a part of the consortium. Okay. Macclesfield or Speed or Leggett are not a part of the consortium. However, Edgecombe County can also assist residents in other areas and jurisdictions um, in the county and in incorporated areas. And I don't know if Mr. Evans would like to add to that. Sure. But, yeah. um, so they, uh, each jurisdiction has to choose to be a part of the consortium and those have chosen not to. But when we take applications for the county as a whole, if we receive applications from those those towns, we will fill them. Okay. So, thank you. And, and that's what I was going to 
what I do. I take it to church because my folks out and they get married because but why would someone not want to be a part of the consortium? Do it cost for something? There is no a lot of paperwork at a small town like Leggett. And then also keep in mind that the formula allocation that HUD shares with us that we have to implement or administer here is based on the population size as well as the demographics of that community or area. So a smaller community, and I think you may have seen that for us with Kanita, right. the percentage. So a, the smaller the jurisdiction is, then the allocation is going to be smaller. So if we look at it as a whole picture, for instance, the town of Kanita's allocation is um, point one. Point one <laughs> and that's equivalent to about 800 and some odd dollars for the year. So it's, it's, it is something to help with assisting with addressing housing needs. But when we look at it from a whole picture, um, Mr. Evans, the county can use some of their funds to possibly help some of those jurisdictions. Some of the because, 15 percent Correct, because that's a larger amount. Not saying that $800 is not, but I'm just trying to kind of make sure you see the picture as to the allocation, how is, how is uh, Catherine doing? And it's something that the federal government sends down that allocation to us, okay? Any other questions or comments? Thank you. I didn't mean Appreciate to say like loaded comments. I'm just gracious no for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I have a citizen who couldn't be here to ask me to ask them questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Are there sound like there's any public hearing? The recommendation is to approve the plan as presented. Does anybody get like At this time, I don't know. Uh, consideration of approval of the plan as presented. Uh, the recommendation is to approve as recommended. Motion? Yes, sir. Second? Yes. Question? All in favor, let me know by the vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, it is approved. <clears throat> Next on the agenda, a public hearing. Call to author to see some comments to the proposed risky year 2022 23 at Small County Bank. The public hearing is called to order. Mm -hmm. Mr. Peters, would you please read the public comments? Yes, sir. Notice is hereby given that the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners will conduct a public hearing on Monday, June 6, 2022, at 7 p.m. for the purpose of receiving citizen comments, reviews, and the proposed allow me, I'll read through my budget message for the benefit of the public here tonight. Uh, submitted herein is the Edgecombe County recommended budget for fiscal year 23. The budget is balanced in its entirety as required by the North Carolina Local Government Budget and Fiscal Control Act. We have approached the preparation of this budget with the following goals in mind. Balancing the budget without a tax increase. Making cuts where possible without compromising operations and service. Addressing critical capital needs addressing critical needs of key outside agencies as much as possible, and providing a reasonable cost of living increase. The proposed Avalorum tax rate for FY23 is 95 cents per $100 in value, which is no change from the current year. One cent generates approximately $342,000. The county's proposed budget for FY23 totals 
$855,842, including our enterprise funds, which are our utilities, um, public utilities, water and sewer, and solid waste. And the proposed budget is a decrease of $2,074,150, or 2.6% from the original budget of the current year. The proposed budget includes a fund balance appropriation of $4 million, $841,975 from general fund. The current year's original fund balance appropriation was $4,383,245. The state requires that we maintain an amount equal to at least 8% of our general fund expenditures and unassigned fund balance. The proposed general fund budget is $69,986,910. 8% of which is $5,598,953. The proposed budget fund balance appropriation to balance FY23 budget does not take us below that requirement. I'll cover some key highlights. First, on revenue. So far this year, our tax collection rate is 95.1%. Thanks to the hard work of our tax administrator and her staff, we ended FY21 with a collection rate of 96.2% which is the highest we've had in at least the last 20 years. Our property tax revenue projections are based on a total valuation of $3,429,810,945, including all real property, personal property, public utilities, and motor vehicles. This is an increase of $1,600,518 in value from last year. The devastating fire at QVC did put a dent of just under $1 million in our potential tax revenues for next year. The total tax value of the facility before the fire was $124,591,160. Now the total value is $22,641,506. A decline in value of $101,949,654 or 82%. Our sales tax revenues are holding steady compared to the last two years, and much higher than our revenues in FY19 and prior. I do project that the current year's sales tax collection will fall just under last year's. I'm still conservatively budgeting projected revenues for sales tax in FY23. A cost of living adjustment of 2% is included in this budget at a cost of approximately $386,000. I'm pleased to share that we will not have an increase in our health insurance premiums for next year, being that we have done well in the last three years with insurance cost to budget. I'm not including an increase in the health insurance as I did in the last two years. I do want to pause here and note that um, from our conversation at your budget work session, you did ask me to go back and look at the budget to see if we are able to do more than the 2%, perhaps 4% at least, maybe 5 And so we're we're doing that review uh, now. As you know, we're, I'm going to be asking you to not vote on this budget tonight, but to vote at a second meeting later this month. And so we'll continue to look at that and to see if we're able, we'll be able to do more than the 2%. The health plan will continue to include a health savings account, or HSA, option that includes a $750 contribution by the county. We will also continue to provide health screenings for all individuals covered by our plan. Individuals who choose not to participate in the screening will pay $50 per month towards the cost of their insurance, as it has been in the past. In addition to medical, dental, and life insurance, employees have a number of cafeteria plans to select from. We will also continue to offer the HealthNet Rx program for staff with chronic diseases who choose to participate, the Employee Assistance Program, or EAP, which offers counseling and other work-life services through both telephonic and face-to-face -face sessions, and a wellness incentive of $250 for those meeting the waste circumference standards and making or making 5% improvement in weight or weight. In order to reduce the amount of fund balance appropriated, we are including a vacancy allowance in our budget. Though not used by us before, this is a common budgeting practice. It allows us to leave all current positions budgeted while factoring in our expected lap salaries due to turnover. We are spread $2.5 million uh, in vacancy allowance over our largest departments. We do need to keep in mind that we will not be able to move money from those salary lines by way of budget amendments throughout the year. We will monitor that closely. 
As you will recall, we increased our minimum salaries to a $10 per hour minimum a few years ago. However, at the time, we did not do the same for part-time staff. I recommend and have included in the draft budget the additional $90,000 we estimate it will cost to raise salaries to a minimum of $10 per part-time staff. This primarily affects the third six site attendants that work in solid waste. This also factors in a tiered approach so that there is some separation based on years of service. Regarding capital outlay, this budget includes a capital, capital outlay expenditures for county operations of $1,195,000, which is a $272,290 increase from this year's original capital outlay budget. Of this, $192,120 is for projects that will not be completed or delivered in the current year and rolled forward. Attached is a detailed list of proposed capital expenditures. Capital funding includes $198,000 for equipment, $307,000 for vehicles, $175,000 for EMS vehicles, uh, $465,000 for buildings and grounds, and also $50,000 set aside for the animal shelter reserve. And that's the total of $1,195,000. Though it is included in debt, it is included in debt service, I do want to point out that $250,000 is budgeted for both the final payment on the loan for the sheriff's vehicles purchased in 2019, as well as the first payment on the new loan to purchase approximately 15 vehicles for the sheriff's office. The cost to operate the landfill continue to exceed the revenues generated. Without a technical <coughs> increase, we are projecting a need to transfer um, $754,000 to solid waste. I recommend to increase tipping fees from $61.50 to $65 for municipal solid waste and from $46 to $50 um, per, 1, 000, per ton excuse me, for construction and demolition. That will help to close the gap by about $100,000. This will put us among the highest in our region with the exception of the city of Rocky Mountain, which is at $66 for municipal solid waste. Though we are very lean on our operations, we will continue to look for ways to cut costs. We have been notified of at least, th of a, of a, at least a 3.5% increase from the town of Tarboro and a possible increase from the city of Rocky Mountain. We believe our current rates are sufficient for water and sewer to cover this increase and therefore recommend no change at this time. However, if the increases are more than expected, I will reconsider my recommendation. The total requested by outside agencies is $16,315,390, which is $2,052,220 above what is allocated this year. We received a request from two new outside agencies this year. However, with our own budget constraints, I do not recommend funding any new agencies this coming fiscal year. The total I recommend for outside agency funding is $14,406,038. This is an increase of $142,868 for outside agencies. My recommendation is that most of the agencies receive no increase from the current year's budget. The changes I do propose are based on ongoing agreements, formula calculations, and statutory requirements. Three volunteer fire departments are requesting an increase in their fire tax. They are Heart Seeds proposing to go from eight cents to 12 cents, Leggett from eight and a half to nine cents, and Fountain from eight and a half to nine cents. I recommend that we call for separate public hearings for citizens in those districts to have the opportunity to make their opinions known before acting on these increases. As you know, Edgecombe has been allocated $9,997,833 in federal ARPA funds, or American Rescue, uh, American Rescue Plan Act, half of which we have already received. The program permits counties to take a standard allowance of up to $10 million as revenue replacement, which we have elected. This will allow greater flexibility of the use of the funds. In my proposed ARPA budget, we can strategically use funds to give some much needed relief to our general fund, satisfy upcoming economic development obligations, address big ticket critical capital needs, provide a one-time and much deserved bonus for our employees, and provide some direct assistance to our citizens. In conclusion, we will continue to 
to monitor the budget closely throughout the year. Save where we can and spend all the necessary. I appreciate the hard work of all our staff who are involved in this long process. I thank the budget committee for your guidance and time invested. I respectfully submit this proposed budget for FY22-23. Uh, again, I, I do ask that you hold this uh, for adoption at a second meeting, which I recommend that you hold on June 27th. I also want to note that I will ask you to take action tonight on what I just described as the uh, proposed use of our ARPA first. So I, I'll let you call for your public hearing first if you want to take action. At this time, I'll call for public comment. Anybody here would like to speak on the budget? Please come forward and state your name and address on the public record. Anybody speak at the public comment? Hearing none, uh, the recommendation is not adopted. That's correct, yes, sir. Yes, do you want us to call the public hearing now? Sir, should we call the public hearing? On? I have that later. Uh, I, I do, sir, before you move on from that, I would ask you to um, to take action tonight to approve the plain use of our federal ARPA fund. Um, we have reviewed this list for the benefit of the public. I'll walk through this. Um, and so, as I just mentioned, the county has received just under $10 million from, the, from U.S. Treasury from this COVID relief program, America Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. Um, the program is allowing counties and towns, and all counties and towns are receiving this money, to take what they call a standard allowance. That is, we can count up to $10 million as revenue replacement, whereas there is the understanding that the pandemic had an impact on our economy and therefore had an impact on counties and towns and their revenue generation. Not only just their collection of revenues, but the potential growth of their revenue stream. And so, being that we receive just under $10 million, we can designate all of our allocation under that category of revenue replacement. At your budget work session, I walked through a list of items that I would recommend that we plan to designate the use of these funds. Now, if, if we're taking the standard allowance of our entire amount, basically what that allows us to do is then to uh, basically transfer that into general fund to use that to replace funds within the general fund and then the equivalent of that amount we can spend that on anything that a county otherwise can spend money on um, and so the things that I share with you and I want to just run through real, real quickly tonight um, some broad categories we've listed first is economic development so part of that will be used $1,686,126,125 in to satisfy the upcoming obligation that you, I know that you're aware that we have for land that we purchased at Kingsburg. Secondly, $2,613,000 to satisfy a second upcoming obligation that will be due this coming uh, spring. Uh, $385,000 to reimburse Carolina's Gateway Partnership for site work that has been completed on our behalf at Kingsborough Industrial Park. Also, uh, earmarking $150,000 for other site work needed, uh, general maintenance upkeep at Kingsborough specifically. Next, under a uh, broad category of infrastructure, um, we're proposing that $1 million of these funds be set aside and earmarked for. Uh, the, uh, uh, for broadband deployment in the county. As you know, at, I think a couple of meetings ago, you approved um, uh, supporting successful applicant from uh, at least four companies that are looking at expanding broadband in the county. Um, you don't necessarily have to designate all of that to whichever uh, uh, is successful with their state grant application through the great grant program, but this will allow you to strategically invest and to help with the expansion of broadband in the county. Uh, under the public health category, um, we're recommending $25,000 to be earmarked for support services for our senior citizens through our Office on Aging. 
$750,000 for HVAC replacement, uh, strategic replacement of uh, units in our county building. Uh, to use $1 million to, um, to supplement or to support uh, payroll and, and public health categories. That will, as I mentioned before, that will give us some, uh, a little bit of relief in how much fund balance we had to appropriate this year. Also $50,000 for additional protective measures related to COVID. Um, under what they refer to as a premium pay category, $1 million, as I mentioned a moment ago, recommending that um, we use that to pay hazard pay bonuses uh, to our staff. Under economic impact, using $250,000 to supplement our crisis intervention program in our Department of Social Services, $100,000 for urgent home renovations, and then um, some additional uh, CIP uh, purchases $220,000 for a new loader at the landfill and $768,708 for a roof replacement at the detention center. So you'll see that all of that adds up to our total allotment, which is $9,997,833. So the action that I'm recommending that you take tonight is that if you're approving uh, us using the standard allowance for ARPA as revenue replacement that we allow these funds to replace general funds uh, in the amount here and that they be used, that those replaced funds be used for the purposes listed um, in your packet that I just read. Go ahead for most of the questions. So for scheduled appointments, we have Mr. Larry Peters. So uh, as, as you know, Larry Peters is uh, lead for North Carolina interns and working with us for almost a year now. Uh, one of the things he's been working on is community voice and part of the community voice is we were able to do our very first citizens academy. And so they have completed uh, their sessions, and uh, Narita is going to uh, recognize our participants. So before I go ahead and um, recognize the folks uh, that participated in the Citizens' Academy, I just want to thank the board for uh, giving me the opportunity to recognize them. Um, I think the Citizens' Academy was a great opportunity to really you know, connect with our citizens and um, I think it's really commendable to those who signed up to be a part of our first semester. So, with that in mind, I'm going to recognize those who participated. Um, so. Up first, uh, Kathy Williams. Gloria Mosley. <laughs> and also getting a Citizen Academy t shirt as well. Mm -hmm. Next up, Virginia Wade.
Dr. Gloria Knight, she's not here tonight, but oh, Linda Knight, yeah, Dr. Linda Knight, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Crystal Wines, Wells Henderson. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I like if we, it would be okay for them to come up and stand behind us. Please, please, please. all of you can come up. Just on behalf of the world, we'd like to congratulate all of you. Okay. You all probably know more about this government now than we do. <laughs> 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 Are they good for you? Can you see them? Can you see all of them? You good, Miss Matthew? You got it, man? Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> but he did, he certainly has created the curriculum for this so it will make it very easy for us to, to continue offering it. And Mr. Peters will be back before you vote on the manager's report to give you an overall update on community board. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Ms. Michelle Essig, your health director, to come and give you your monthly. Uptick in numbers, and we have not. 
Um, but part of that is too, there's a lot of places that you can get a vaccination now. So um, we are glad to share that job About with the call. in the county. Um, but, but we have not seen a major increase in that. And you can see that in our percentages. Um, at least one dose, we're still at 55%. Two doses, we're at 51%. We've stayed that way for a few months now. And looking at um, how many have received one booster, we're at 25%. And so now it is recommended that children age 5 to 11 years old get a booster shot. So we are in the preparation of getting our supplies ready for that. And we will take appointments on Friday for that age group as well to receive a booster if any parent wants their child to have a booster. Um, and if you'll note, it's only for Pfizer that's doing the age 5 to 11 for a booster. It's now recommended also that children age 12 and up who are immunocompromised that they get a, a second booster now. Okay, so those are the new changes. You may have heard a little bit of talk, we talked a little while back about the age six months to four years old, and then they put it on hold. So they've now sent us um, an email that the state is anticipating by the end of this month that that will be approved. Um, and so when that happens, we will offer it because a lot of pediatrician offices are not providing immunization. All that up, update and it's an uptick. Uh, your office not recommending that people go back to wearing masks in close areas or still optional. So, you know, for healthcare facilities, even when it went to optional, we're still required to. So, if on the sixth floor, if you come to the health department, you, you have to wear a mask in um, any type of closed um, area. Which we, our staff still is not you know, meeting in big groups. So, anytime that we We do go by appointment just so we can make sure, you know, um, if there's a vial, they send it to in vials, and so you have so many doses that are in a vial, so we want to anticipate to make sure that we have enough on hand. The state only sends you so much based off your numbers. Yeah. But you could call that day and, you know, or walk in and say, hey, you know, hey, I want to get my booster, and we'll get you right in. Yeah, a lot of it's still um, the, looking like the Omicron, which the, the sinus, you know, 
which is like a year, a lot of people think that they have like a sinus or sinus infection. So it, it's still looking like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, with not having any tests that shows you that it's not as severe this time, right now. So. Other questions? Hearing none, thank you.
appraised value of property must be used as its tax value on all real and personal property subject to taxation in the county as provided in GS 105283. And whereas the Edgecombe County Board of Equalization and Review after the due notice has required by law duly commenced in its meeting on April 4, 2022 and after taking and subscribing to the oath required by law proceeded with the dispatch of its duties and whereas the said Board of Equalization and Review has heard and given due consideration to all complaints and appeals that have come to its attention from the taxpayer to own or control taxable property assessed for taxation in Edgecombe County with respect to the valuation of such property or the property of others. And whereas the said board has examined and reviewed the tax list for each township for the current year has listed and assessed all real and personal property subject to taxation in the county which has been omitted from said list and brought to its attention has corrected all errors brought to its attention and names persons subject to action to be taken on pending appeals to this board in description of property and assessment and valuation of all taxable property appearing on said list and said board has increased or decreased or left unchanged the appraisal appraised valuation now therefore the resolve of the Edgecombe county board of equalization and review that all changes in name description or valuation made by said board shall be reflected upon the tax records of the county by correction, rebate, or additional charge, and in that when all such changes have been given effect upon the tax records and the scrolls of tax books have been checked, totaled, and balanced, the same shall be, and the same are hereby declared to be the permanent tax list and assessment role of Edgecombe County for 2022, subject to provisions of Chapter 105 of the General Statutes of North Carolina, the second day of May. Oh, I did not change that. This six day of June. I believe y'all had an updated one, 2022. And then it will require you guys to sign. Motion to approve. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know by the vote sign. Aye. Aye. All opposed, stand by. Uh, it is approved. Go ahead and sign that one. Sign that one. Um, is there anything else to come? No, sir. What is for? Just the adjourn for the year. Here, none. The motion to join the Board of Equalization and Review and reconvene the regular board of commissioners. Second. Any questions? All in favor, let it be known by the vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed? Here, none. We now stand again at the Board of Commissioners. Thank you. While we're signing that, uh, it's time for public petition. Is there anybody present that would like to address the board on anything that might not necessarily be on the agenda? Is there anybody present? Mr. Chairman, we have uh, Mr. Camilla's hand so he's able to see the board tonight. Okay, please come forward. Mr. P.O. Box 1391 Pine South, North Carolina. Uh, Silica address 127 Midway Lane, Tarbury, North Carolina 27886. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for allowing me to sit on the uh, Animal Control Committee. And I'm glad that we have made some progress and announced about the animal shelter. Uh, the school emergency. I have recorded all the meetings and posted them on YouTube for anybody to see. I got a call this evening right before I left home. Someone asked me about um, where was District 6 and who was the commissioner. They say they um, were reading about, I guess, or probably did a video about coming. So I told them who we were and where, where um, the area was located. Um, the comments were very interesting at the, um, the joint meeting with the school board on, I think, last week, whatever week it was. Um, it was not Edgecombe County Commissioners that came to this conclusion. It was Nash County Commissioners 
and it appears that this board seems to be punishing themselves, uh, speaking for me. Um, I think you got an upcoming public hearing you're going to schedule, and like I said, at one of the other meetings, I think you all need to um, uh, announce where you all stand as a board so people can be more informed and see where we're headed. Um, during those um, hearings, well not hearings, but meetings, um, there was a lot of emphasis put on new schools and all those kinds of things, but like I said, one of them, we need to get to the root cause and the final analysis, how it all began, where we're headed, and um, matter of fact, someone had called me right before the um, joint meeting because they were concerned where um, Commissioner Harris stood, and um, I think she made um, her comments known and clear. And we also asked about the power, and um, I think her comments they sort of saw they were born. But this board, I think um, you need to go ahead, and I know you got to come here, but the people need to be led because this is somewhat confusing to some that don't know all that's going on and just make it plain and clear. So when you do have a public hearing, that people know what all is at stake. Now I've been following this board a lot of years and the school board, a lot of times in these meetings right by myself. So um, for anyone that have an issue with me speaking on it, not this board, but me too, um, just see me, because I put in the time, put in the work, have it documented, like I said, got the meetings documented, for anyone that wants to go see it, I do this out of pocket. So people like myself that work can see it. So um, I appreciate you all, and I look forward to you all getting to merge of the time on board my set set. So, Mr. Chairman, we have before you <coughs> budget amendments for your consideration. I would like to just point out a, a, a few things or a, a few of them. If you look at budget amendment number one in your packets, I want to point out these are fines that are collected uh, at the state level and sent to the county uh, for our schools. Um, Prior to, we were not required to budget the receipt and expenditure of these funds, uh, but now we've been told that we are to do that, and so this is to uh, create these uh, budget lines and to budget for uh, the amount expected to receive, be received here uh, in this current fiscal year. And again, these are funds that go to our schools. Uh, budget amendment number, number eight, I want to point out that um, the, our Juvenile Crime Prevention Council funds, we receive funds every year. Uh, sometimes there are additional funds that are received. Sometimes if one agency is not able to uh, spend all of their funds, then that is recalled for the end of the fiscal year. We have to it um, to um, other programs that apply for it. So we are receiving an additional $26,079. Um, also, you'll see $1,700 appropriated that is for the local match, you will recall that the county um, is required to match at a 10% is usually somewhere around dollars $24,000. Looking back at the budget, uh, we did not have the correct number in uh, earlier in the beginning of the year for our budget. And so that is to correct that adding at $1,700 for that um, number to be correct, $24,804 for our local match. Um, Let's see, also you have at your place uh, an additional budget amendment. I'll ask you to consider this one uh, late-breaking budget amendment after we prepared the package due out on Friday. This is a fairly routine budget amendment from our Solid Waste Department, moving some funds from employee insurance and distributing those uh, among some other lines that are um, somewhat slightly over budget. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on the Questions for the Okay, now that's a motion to approve. Second. Second. Questions. All in favor, let me know by the roadside. Aye. Aye. All opposed, and I'll do approve. Thank you. Thank you. 
Item B is regarding the approval of right away conveyance by the community college. Uh, NCDOT is planning a road widening project on Wilson Street and has approached the community college to purchase a land right of way. Uh, the appraiser has completed his work and the Board of Trustees voted to sell the right of way. Um, you, you must also approve the attached deed uh, for the right of way. I do recommend that you approve this as presented. As a note, as I understand that this is a widening project that's going to run from Western Boulevard all the way to McNair Road. And of course, you're attending to the portion that runs just in front of the community college. Motion. Questions? Questions? Oh, that's everybody that's going by the most time. Aye. Aye. All opposed? And all this is percent. Not a is I don't see. Um, though there have been brief community meetings held in Rocky Mount together since an input on the possible county line school merger, I suggest that the board hold its own public hearing. I recommend that public hearing be called for at your July 5th, 2022 meeting. since they will increase the tax to citizens each of those five uh, each of those fire districts i recommend that you call for a public hearing for each district to be held at a meeting to be called on june 27 um, of this month yes sir is there a motion to call for a public hearing for negative second My responsibility to annually review the county's compensation plan and make recommendations for modifications. My review of the plan involves consideration of maintaining a competitive compensation structure while being mindful of what our budget can sustain. Though I believe our salaries need to be raised to be more competitive with comparable positions in both the public and private sector, our budget cannot withstand that at this time. Therefore, I, this proposed compensation plan includes no changes. I recommend your approval of the 22-23 compensation plan as presented. Motion. Motion. Second. Yes, second. Question. We've received an uh, application for a permit for the fireworks from the, for the town of Tarboro and their fireworks display. Um, I recommend that you authorize the fire marshal to issue the required permit as, as requested. Motion to approve. Motion. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know by the vote sign aye. All opposed? Here and none is approved. Item G, uh, as you know, North Carolina General Statute does allow you to award a retiring officer his or her service weapon. It specifically states that you may do so at a price determined by you as the governing body. Sheriff Atkinson has requested that consideration be given, given for retiring Sergeant Brady Abel. To show the county's appreciation for his exemplary service and to provide a memento to that service, I recommend that you approve the transfer of his service weapon at a price of one dollar upon the retirement of Sergeant Brady Hayden. Motion. So moved. Second. 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 Second.
item H, it, uh, you'll need to select a voting de delegate for both the National Association of Counties Annual Conference in July, as well as the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners Conference in August. Uh, Commissioner Harris does plan to attend both conferences to represent the county. Therefore, I recommend that you approve or that you take action to um, delegate or select Ms. Harris to be your voting delegate for both of those times. Item I, uh, attached to your consideration is our water and sewer department's capital improvement plan. Uh, this provides a way for, a way to plan for the phase build out of needed infrastructure in the county as well as capital purchases needed to maintain our existing system. This plan lists desired projects, plan capital par uh, purchases, estimated costs, and the number of citizens potentially benefiting from the project. I recommend that uh, the approval of the uh, Capital improvement plan for this year. So making that transition, we now have 11 analog phones and 295 um, other phones um, that are no longer usable for us. And so I recommend that you uh, vote to surplus uh, these phones and then authorize us to uh, place those on dove deals for sale. We have four contracts before you tonight. One contract is with the uh, Solid Waste Department. This is for our tipping fees, which includes transporting our municipal solid waste to the regional landfill. Um, you also have three contracts for legal services uh, for the three different programs in the Department of Social Services. I recommend that you approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Question. All in favor of the in your packet, uh, your monthly workforce development indicators report. Um, I would also like to invite Mr. Nairi Peters to come back to the podium, and he's going to give you an overview of our community voice Thank you. So uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about community voice, and this is at the very 
we spoke a little bit about the initiative, but this time is a little different because my time here in Eshman County is actually ending at the end of this month. So it's sort of a recap of some of the work that we've done, the framework that we've built with community voice. So before really jumping into community voice, I think it's kind of important to, to, to explain how I got here. Um, and, and, and I put that picture there because that was kind of my face uh, when I first heard about the initiative, the idea of wanting to, um, you know, increase our community engagement. Um, you know, I am here at Eshel County through a program that I believe for North Carolina. Um, and the way that program works is that they recruit you to join the program, and then you interview with your host sites. And Eshel County was one of the host sites that I interviewed with. And I, I knew that the work scope that I was coming into would be, you know, working on trans increasing transparency and community engagement, but it's a very broad, you know, assignment to be given, and there wasn't much of a framework for community engagement in Metro County prior, you know, besides social media or the traditional form of communication, that is, phone calls and emails. Um, so we wanted to come up with a program, and that is Community Voice. Now, what is Community Voice? It's a citizen outreach initiative designed to strengthen the county's external communication and increase government transparency while creating new opportunities for citizen engagement of a mouthful, so to get more detailed, some of our goals are, you know, creating new tools for exchanging information while improving our existing tools, making measurable improvements to our county functions and services based on citizen input, increasing citizen access to county services, increasing government transparency, increasing civic capacity, and increasing equity across communication, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to access the services that we offer. Um, so, so here's an overview of some of those projects. Um, now, one of the biggest ones was the Citizens Academy, Eshco 101. That is, was an opportunity to really take citizens behind the scenes to show them you know, um, what our county departments do and some of the thought process that goes into administering those services. Um, if you see on screen, some of the photos we have are from our different sessions. Um, you know, we have Mr. Kaiser um, presenting at our session on public works. Ms. Etheridge, the health director, presenting on us at our session on human, our health and human services, and uh, Dr. Greg uh, while talking about uh, some of the uh, program offered at the college. So it wasn't just department supervisors, it was also, um, you know, um, really uh, um, you know, members of the community who uh, hold that, that weight in, in a sense, you know, high, high profile members of the community. Uh, also, we have in the middle, you see a photograph from us inside of the mobile command unit that the um, emergency services department used. And he was talking a bit about uh, how it was used during the uh, fire at QBC. Um, so, you know, on the screen, right, it shows that the class started February 22nd and ran through May 17th. Some of the classes talked about government administration, health and human services, education, emergency services, public records, and public safety. And, you know, in the future, we'd like to have more sessions, you know. These, this isn't the perfect framework. These aren't, this isn't the perfect uh, schedule or curriculum in any way, shape, or form, but I think this really gives a solid foundation. Um, and you know, just a few um, the comments that were given from some of the participants. You know, I found the academy to be instrumental. And every resident should attend. I hope all of the government follow um, and, and you know, I think, um, it's important to mention that a big, big part of what made the Citizen Academy work were the presenters, the department supervisors. Their passion for the work that they do was, was conveyed in every single one of our sessions. And I think that um, made it um, a lot easier for citizens to connect with them and also to uh, learn from them about how they can access these services better. Um, so another um, project was the Citizen Feedback Forum. And spoke to you guys about that before, and this was really important as a part of Community Voice because it allowed us to gauge our progress and also to be candid feedback from our citizens. Um, just kind of the layout of how to use it. It's available on the county website under the Residents and Highway tab. Um, and you can also access it as a direct link. Um, but it's pretty easy. Just first, choose a relevant department. I'm sure you just say county manager. Second, select the type of feedback. You know, there's complaint, service requests, compliments, suggestions, or others. Uh, three, leave your feedback in the blank box and choose whether you wish to remain anonymous. The 
gas the phone will be sent to the appropriate department supervisor. Uh, however, there will be no follow-up. And as we know, fill out your contact information, how you should be contacted. Uh, so some of the other projects, and you may have come across these on our social media or YouTube, um, some of our YouTube series. Um, I know some of the commissioners were part of um, our COVID-19, why I got the shot videos. Um, and these really were designed to provide citizens a behind the scenes look at the county government and to, to, to connect to the lives of their local officials, you know, uh, hearing a little bit about their struggles or a journey during this pandemic. Um, also, Let's Talk Edgecombe was a podcast hosted by county manager and I, and the purpose of the podcast was to, you know, provide a fun and relaxed format. And, um, you know, another thing that we tried was, you know, social media campaigns. Uh, for example, during April, National County Government Month, we really tried to uh, uh, ramp up our social media posts to really get people on, uh, you know, more aware about, you know, different services that the county government offered. We're honestly perfectly aligned with community voice, but that along with just other frequent posts uh, were used to, you know, engage our citizens to make them more aware of you know, things going on here at the county. So some of the results, you know, there are now 130 plus minutes of informational content out there across our different platforms, you know, podcasts, um, uh, videos, etc. You know, we've had over 100 submissions to the citizens most of which have been anonymous, so there haven't really been, there couldn't have been that same level of follow-up, but those that we do know who um, submitted them, they have been mitigated to some degree. So, and you know, 100 may not seem like a huge number, but how the citizen feedback form not been implemented, those folks may never have had the opportunity to make those uh, comments heard. And a 150% increase in Facebook pages, which I think uh, you know, correlates to our and our frequency and posts. So I always like to end presentations with this question, what's next? I mean, where do you go with community voice? So we're just, you know, pushing community engagement here in Edgecombe County. Um, I think really um, just be creative, um, to be not afraid to you know, fall forward, um, to try things that don't work. You know, well, we did that several times, you know, things that we tried once, and well, okay, that didn't really work out the way we thought it would, so we you know, move on to something else. I think um, that's really a big part of a project like this. Also, listening to the community, uh, hearing about what they need, um, you know, and um, that's really a big, big part of it, is making sure that you're addressing, um, you know, the public needs. Um, and just, like I said, um, building on top of the framework that are revealed, such as Citizens Academy, Harris asked about whenever we're going to have our next session, and I hope that it will be in the fall. Um, that curriculum and framework has been given um, to uh, Mr. Evans and uh, Ms. Beth, so hopefully they'll you know, pick that up in the future. Um, but yeah, I think really just building on what we've had, um, I will be both of last year. And last but not least, thank you. Um, you know, thank you to the board, um, thank you to the public, thank you to the, the department supervisors, thank you county executives for really um, giving the agency to work on such a project. You know, it's been really a privilege uh, to, to really come in and uh, have the opportunity to just start from scratch. You know, and, and the trust that's been given to me has, it's been such an honor. So I, I really just want to give you guys that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and I think um, that's the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority. And um, what's awesome is I think that the work that I've done here, the portfolio that I've built, built here in Ashland County has really a large influence on, and at least in my opinion, on me getting this position. So that's what I'm